Hello, I'm Dr. Frank Vazileri. I'm chair of the STS Practice Management Workforce, and welcome to an STS video roundtable. Today we're going to be discussing how to reduce cost in your practice. We have uh, four other panelists here, Dr. Ray Singer from Allentown, Pennsylvania, Dr. Kevin Eccolate from Orlando, Florida, Dr. Robin Cohen from uh, Los Angeles, and Dr. Paul Levy from Jonesboro. Um, I wanted to get the discussion going with talking about what is value in practice, certainly what is value in cardiac surgery. We talk about value as being uh, outcomes per unit cost. And in heart surgery, especially with the STS database, we have a really good understanding of outcomes. Probably one of the best understanding and the most rigorous understanding of clinical outcomes in all of healthcare. But we're really struggling with the cost part. How, how do you think we can, or do you think measuring costs is possible and are we doing a good job or not? Well, you know, a very simple formula uh, is just that value is quality over cost. So um, the ideal s scenario would be to improve your quality while decreasing cost. I think the single biggest challenge facing cardiothoracic surgery is what we refer to unexplained clinical variation. You can have a group of six cardiothoracic surgeons, and they will do the same procedure six different ways. And if you look at the cost per case, let's say a, a routine cabbage, and you look at your institution, it is striking to see uh, the variability in uh, the cost per case. That cost could be because of the materials that are used. One surgeon may use uh, an expensive glue on the distals. Another one will use a less expensive glue. And a third surgeon uses no glue. Even in the post-operative clinical pathways, uh, whether or not you have uh, protocols such as an AFib prevention protocol. But I think unexplained clinical variations is really the, uh, the, the most paramount part of it that we need to solve. I think we need to come together and be more efficient and as teams and then across, across the nation um, come up with what the best practices are and then stick to it and measure it. So that's an interesting point because what I was trying to say before is that it's very difficult to really understand what true costs are. It's not impossible, but it's, it's very difficult. It can be actually time consuming. I think your approach is to get right to the, the, ba the bottom part of it and try to fix clinical variation or variance in different practice patterns. Has anybody else on the, on the panel had any experience with that or any pushback uh, as leaders or chiefs in your sections or departments, have you had any pushback with trying to reduce ind individual surgeon practice variations? I think to, to add on to what he said, um, because I think that's the next point, but you know, costs have always been a difficult thing for us as clinicians to get our arms around because there's costs and there's charges and, and it wasn't until recently we actually could see true costs. You know, what, what does this one particular entity cost? And the, the, the difference or the uncertainty of what quality is, because quality to us may be different things, but to a patient means they, they went and came in, oper got an operation, they went home, they did well. I mean, the quality versus efficiency over cost. So I think some of those things were, behooves us to, to kind of define those, I think, as we come up with ideas. But uh, I couldn't agree more that, that uh, there's, there's variations of practice uh, all wanting the same goal, but yet using different vehicles to get there, whether it's instrumentation or, or devices. But, but I think that's the, the, the main thing right now in, in our hospital system is truly understanding the, some of the hospital accounting principles as well as, as uh, you know, what true cost is of an entity as opposed to the add-ons or the, the for, for other, um, uh, for other uh, people that work at the hospital or for uh, their discretionary costs that, that kind of get added on to what true costs are. Right. So that's I exactly think that's, right. that's one thing that's been difficult for us. How have you handled that? I mean, I think there are two key things that you both are talking about. I think there's transparency in knowing what the cost data is. Um, if you don't know it, you, you can't fix it. You can't make it, in, you can't put it into actionable buckets. The other thing is what you're alluding to is waste whether it be looking at uh, less costly substitutes that are just as efficacious, looking at time motion, where you're wasting time. So those are all important things, and those obviously can be actionable. Um, but we need clarity in our data, and 
we need common goals amongst the team. So I, I think that's, for in our institution, that's what we've really been working on. But I think it's also important, and, and you brought it up, is how do you package it in order to get buy-in from partners or, or, or other surgeons who, when they find out about the variability, I mean, nobody wants to find out that they're the most expensive guy in the group or the guy in the hospital. And, and it's almost semantic in, in, in the sense that you want to eliminate variability by promoting standardization. Let's agree on the best way to do it and standardize it and then develop ways where everybody's going to buy in, whether it, it needs to be uh, oversight of the nurses. You know, for us, it's particularly challenging in a training situation where not only are we train, trying to, to change into a cost-effective environment, but we're trying to train other surgeons to do it. And, and to have them not screw up our system. So it's, it's so much of it about is, is, is you're right, standardization of, of what you do and agreeing on what that's gonna mean. So with standardization, I tell my surgeons, uh, there are things that we can't take care of. For example, as you point out, uh, there seems to be a mystery of what actual costs are, and, and I get that. But I tell my surgeons, let's take care of the things we can take care of. So for example, DPC cards, we call them doctor preference cards. Every operating room has them. I would argue that if you sat down with your team and looked at your doctor preference cards, you would be amazed at the variability. You'd be amazed at some things that the nurses will automatically open that you may not have even used uh, in months. So that gets to efficiency, it gets to waste, but these are things you, you, you can control. I think when you look at the value formula of quality over cost, we have to remember that perhaps the focus needs to be as much on quality as some of these other things because quality care costs less. And the fact is that there are many times when we do things that uh, kind of push the edge so much that we raise the cost artificially. Uh, and uh, whether it's a patient that truly was futile, you know, a patient that clearly uh, was not a candidate for surgery, and yet uh, we pushed it, and then the cost was such that the patient was in the ICU for 30 days, only to be placed on hospice. I mean, we have to look at the quality side of it, too, uh, so that we're doing the right procedure at the right time for the right reasons. Do you, and we bring up a great point. Do you believe that there is an inherent conflict between quality and cost, so to speak? If you have an infinite amount of co or ability to spend, you can improve your quality. Or as you say, good quality leads to lower cost. I think the data would show that good quality does lead to lower cost. I agree with that. Lower infection rate, right. lower ICU rate, uh, you know, decreased length of stay, decreased um, uh, time on mechanical ventilation, and all those things decrease cost in general. Um, so if I can summarize what we've been saying is that we, we probably still don't have a good way to calculate true costs but we may not need to do that because there's low hanging fruit that we can approach with some a little bit of work and due diligence to at least try to make processes more efficient and maybe more standardized, um, such as looking at doctor preference cards and looking at variance between two or three different surgeons in a group and also uh, trying to get buy-in from your partners in your practice and your hospital to start address some of these things. I, I agree, there is, there is a way I wanna, to start. Frank, I wanna push back a little bit. I think, you know, one thing that's been very successful with, with me and Jonesboro is I've really partnered with our CFO. And, you know, I've gotten buy-in from the CEO of the organization, who's basically, you know, made it a strategic initiative to make cardiac surgery a profitable en endeavor. So that's the, that's the administrative side. You know, the physician side mostly Quality, focusing on quality, but cost indifferent. That's that's kind of where they were, and we've moved it to the middle by getting really transparency and cost. So we've really drilled down. We've come up with a production cost and revenue tool, and we can tell you by DRG what your costs are and 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 really drill down into actionable buckets. Paul, can and, you describe that a little bit? Because I know you've shown that to me, and I think it would be worthwhile to talk a little bit about yeah, it's, it's how, a, did you came, how did you come up with that well, and what does it, it look like? Well, it took about two years. Uh, when I first got to Jonesboro, Arkansas, I went to the, the uh, CFO's office, and I said, are we Medicare profitable? He said, well, it depends. I said, what do you mean it depends? Uh, he said, well, it all depends on what you're looking at. And, and I said, well, well let's, it should be yes or no and it should be yes or no by DRG. 
Um, and we then uh, started drilling down. He gave me scads of paper and I'd spend my weekends looking through it, trying to create actionable cost buckets. The actual cost buckets uh, in, uh, were room and board, um, uh, inventory management, blood bank utilization, pharmacy, laboratory, and you can, and most of the costs were steeped in the operating room and the ICU first couple days. So we really focused there. Uh, we then were able to drill down in this, using this, this tool, uh, and you can, I can tell you by hospital in our system, by physician in our system, who's profitable, who's not profitable for any, it's not, it's not just by Medicare, it's any payer. So it's payer non-specific. I mean, you can get specific if you like. And so I can tell you by name, by surgeon, by DRG, who's profitable, who's not, what their margins are. And then after presenting the data, we're, because there are four different hospitals, we're now using just direct costs, those costs that a physician has control of. Basically. So you're not looking at total cost, which would include things like capitalization, overhead, use of a Correct, part of a because, room or facility. Because in this journey, I found that that's, quote unquote, one of the CEOs said, it's noise. It's noise for physicians because right. they don't have any control over it, so they, it, it's a distraction. It's a smoke screen. To, to, <clears> what, to what extent is, is cost indifference not cost ignorance? Uh, I mean, one of the issues I, is... I don't draw a distinction. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, but one of the issues there is hospitals have so much trouble actually telling you what things cost. I mean, so why? frequently well, why? they have but no why? idea. That's one of the things that we've done, and, and uh, to, to your point earlier, um, you know, people don't like to see that they're the most expensive, but what we've created is scorecards. Mm -hmm. And uh, we sit down with one of our IT people, we can see exactly our costs. And again, to your point, it's very apropos, it's, it's costs that you can control whether you have less things opened up, whether you, you use a hemostatic agent that is, you, you see a list of them, you go, my God, I didn't know the one I was using is that expensive. I'm an outlier. And this works just as good or just as well, okay. and, and the, my partners are using it. So we, we worked very hard at, at, at uh, and not so much initially, and I think it has to be a process, because, mm -hmm. you know, strategy uh, eats, cult, uh, culture eats strategy for lunch every day, you know, they like to say, and, and, and it's true, you're trying to create a culture saying, okay, here's the deal, you're not, you can't use this stuff any longer, and you're going to do just like he does, that's not going to work. Yeah. So to be successful, I think you need to at least start with one, knowing what your costs are, true costs, what is, you know, what, what is this cost, mm -hmm. and, you know, exactly, what do you pay for it, more so, not what's built into it to, to pay for everything else. And then I think you need to, uh, what we've done has been successful is, is you need to create a scorecard. So I know for a cabbage or an aortic valve what my costs are. Then it gives me a starting point. And realizing, like you said, it took a couple of years, it is a process. Uh, it's not a quarterly deal or a, 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 something that'll take six months. So I think the, the biggest thing I think to, to create um, cost conscious cardiac surgeons is one, create a process and recreate a culture of understanding what things cost and then decreasing it. This is a great opportunity actually right now for, for cardiothoracic surgeons with the uh, bundle payments and um, you know we know that the, the cabbage uh, bundle payments that are going to be out there. Uh, I think it's an opportunity for surgeons to get together as you said in a collaborative fashion with cardiologists, with IT, uh, with your analytics team <clears throat> and come up with clinical pathways that make sense and decide on dashboards what it is we want to measure. Because even uh, measurements of uh, time from cath lab to OR, you know, the pre-operative length of stay, post-operative length of stay, your incidence of atrial fibrillation. So, so much of this, uh, again, gets back to quality. But if you were able to come up with, for example, the atrial fibrillation protocol and reduce your length of stay by a half day, that could be millions of dollars for the institution. across silos is, is huge in the hospital. And in the hospital, we have, everybody works in silos. And right. so by collaboration across those silos, you get some of the best people together. So at Lehigh Valley Health Network, we're actually breaking down the traditional academic departments. We have departments of medicine, department of surgery. Well, in the department of surgery as a cardiothoracic surgeon, I have more in common with my interventional cardiologist than I do my bariatric surgeons. Right. But the bariatric surgeons in the department of surgery, and I think as we go forward with ACOs and this whole new model, uh, we need to think in terms of service lines. And in service lines, that's where our, uh, our true costs can be controlled. 
The classic example would be in technology with Tavar. I think there's a general consensus that at most institutions there is a loss of revenue because of Tavar. But what we're not accounting for are downstream revenues, the CTAs, the TEs, the cardiac catheterizations, um, and maybe uh, other aspects of, of, of the halo effect of having new technologies. If you have the academic uh, departments, you may not be able to track everything, to your point about measurement. But if you do this, let's say, in a cardiac institute or in a service line model, these new silos, you, and you're working in a collaborative fashion, you can uh, have better accounting. Without better accounting, without be better metrics, without better dashboards, it's going to be really hard to move, move the ball. I'll give you a starting point. I'm, I'm probably one of the, the only guys here that's in true private practice still. We're in that 23, 24 percentile cardiac surgeons. So it's imperative that you mentioned the relationship with administration, your financial aspect of that. It's imperative that you have that because you have to be transparent and open for us to help them and, and, and vice versa, for them to have the resources to, to have people to, to help take care of the patients and, and carry on our usual day. So uh, that's, that's kind of an interesting aspect because you're, you're, you're in a different circumstance, I think, in an employment model. But we've created that and been successful with that because we're doing it under the auspices or umbrella of a cardiovascular institute. We're, we're members of, so that's that's been helpful. But I couldn't, uh, I agree completely where you have to be able to sit down with them in a transparent manner to be successful at doing any of this. So as we're, we need to wrap up here, but I want to summarize and, and give our SDS members who are watching this some takeaways and some actionable uh, items that they can work with at their own institutions. Um, and I'll start with saying, again, we, we discussed the value uh, cost quality equation uh, and whether or not you're able to define true cost at least at the outset doesn't mean you can't start becoming more efficient. And I want everybody just to give, if you can summarize one point that you want as a takeaway for our members. I think you, you need to move forward with reducing uh, clinical variation. When I said earlier unexplained clinical variation. We can't continue to do things just because that's the way we always have done them. I would encourage members to have weekly meetings uh, with your team uh, to go over the quality, you know, quality division meetings, to look at your DPC cars, and to start asking the questions, why do we do it this way? And the answer can't be because, well, we always did it that way because it may not be the best way. Kevin? Okay. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. In addition, I think that, um, as we discussed before, I think you have to have an understanding uh, with your financial individuals in the hospital, uh, whether you're in private practice or employed, uh, I think it goes both ways, that, that you have to understand what something costs. Because if you don't understand the variability, it's difficult to do the standardization and, and really have an impact. So that would be my uh, addition to his comment, which I felt was very appropriate as well. Robin, any final comment? Um, I would agree. I, I think you have to have a champion, and I think that you have to have oversight. You know, when somebody triggers a, a transfusion, there has to be somebody who the next day is going to go, I noticed you, you broke the rules. Let's, let's talk about that. Okay. Paul, any final words? Yeah, just find waste in your system and your processes and, and try to eliminate it. I would say uh, there's one other aspect that's kind of the elephant in the room, and that is how do we get paid as physicians? We are moving from volume to value, but most full-time contracts are still based on volume. And I think if you're going to make that paradigm shift, we have to look at creative employment contracts that work based on value. And that's something we addressed at uh, yesterday's practice management yeah. summit. How, what, how does a cardiac surgeon add value, not just technically in the operating room, but in the health system in general? Yeah, and in private practice, of course, we call the same thing co-management agreements, exactly. where there's a relationship which is now uh, you know, okayed by the, uh, uh, administration. the uh, administration that, that they can we, that can be created. So, it, in other words, if you create a win-win circumstance, then everyone's uh, yep. you know, all, a rising tide raises all ships. Yeah, I think value really helps us all to row, the, to row in the uh, same direction, sure. you know, as opposed to the volume. Well, I want to thank everybody on the panel, and I hope this discussion on value, quality, and costs 
uh, in cardiac surgery is helpful to everybody uh, out there in practice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.